Dear future self, I'm writing to you today for both our sake. These words are for us both. Don't be fooled, words weren't always my friend, and for a long time they were foe. In the past, we fought with the same stubbornness of siblings, a game of tug of war between meaning and syntax. It was an unforgiving puzzle that for most of my life seemed unsolvable. Language itself was always too limiting, never capable of exactly expressing. And in the words of Herman Hesse, a poet, novelist, and painter, they always become a little different immediately after they are expressed, a little distorted, a little foolish. And for limited means of expression, he sure expresses the dilemma well. For the time I wasn't buried in a Hemingway novel, I took refuge in art. Each brushstroke was a language of its own, and a, lang and a language that seemed to come much more naturally to me than the English one. In many ways, painting influenced my own view of writing as I took note of the ways in which Hemingway found inspiration in the paintings of Paul Cezanne, a French post-impressionist painter. After spending his lunches in Parisian cafes writing, Hemingway often took trips to local museums and not just perused the works of art, but truly studied them. He found a particular affinity for Cezanne's landscape paintings. He admired the way Cezanne painted with thick, blunt strokes, the way there was no need for intricate and extraneous details, and the way he only needed few strokes to depict a realistic-looking mountain. Hemingway mimics Cezanne's brushstrokes with his simplistic and straightforward style of writing. With his blunt but powerful words, he only needs few to get his point across. Following in Hemingway's footsteps, I took I began to look at my own paintings for some guidance. As anyone in my family may be able to tell you, growing up, I was a perfectionist. And on second thought, the word perfectionist is still too subtle to express the intensity of it. Any assignment I was given would often take me double the amount of time as any other student. For this, I was often scrutinized as I may have taken my third grade in-class art projects a little too seriously. A classmate and I were paired up and sent outside to begin our poster-sized map of our made-up island. Long story short, I wouldn't let him do any of it and ended up having to take the poster home to finish. When all of my classmates had finished their entire drawing by the end of class, I had only finished a portion of the ocean surrounding the island. You see, for me, the streaks the blue marker made had to all be going the same direction, had to be the same length, same shade of blue even. As you can imagine, it took me forever. It was nuances like these that didn't bother others, but made a world of difference to me. Fast forward to freshman year when in Donis' painting one class, I discovered a new love for writing, or for painting. <laughs> there was something freeing about the mess paint leaves behind and the way it dances so unpredictably. It was something that no matter how much I tried, I could not make perfect. Yet somehow I began to find beauty in that. In terms of writing, this realization opened up a whole new world of possibilities. The style that I paint nowadays is far from realistic and even farther from perfection. I try to transfer this mindset to my writing as well. Now, I cannot sit here and tell you that I've completely stopped hyperfixating on everything in both my painting and my writing. That would be a flat out lie. Though I am saying that sometimes when I do put words to paper, I try and look at them not as a writer, but as a painter. The lens of a painter allows me to see the full painting at a glance. <laughs> In all honesty, I feel really insecure about showing this to you all. <laughs> when you look at it, you might see the portrait of a famous Tejana singer. But when I look at it, I see a long list of imperfections. My art has taught me to forgive myself to realize it is not always about the finished canvas, but about the attempt. And yes, if I could go back, I probably would change a few strokes, though many of my mistakes I would keep. The way the black background overpowers her adds a whole new meaning to her fading away. At first I thought it was too bold, too consuming, though learn to realize that maybe the emphasis is true, a sorrow a memento to her sudden death. I've grown to love the way her bangs seem a bit clumpy and don't fall exactly as they should on her forehead. Because truly, who's due? <laughs> Above all, my art has taught me that imperfection is the truest and realest thing there is. That perfection is a fantasy and nothing more.
Fernanda Pazoa enlightens me of the fact that we worship perfection because we cannot have it, and we would loathe it if we did. Perfection is inhuman to be, because to be human is to be imperfect. Just as my paintings, my writing will probably never be perfect, and that's okay. Words are just as messy as paint. And as I grew to love and admire the challenge of putting indescribable thoughts into words, the words themselves began to play an entirely new role in my life. As I described before in the past, not being able to perfectly encompass my thoughts or ideas often made me feel hopeless. To me, language was always focused around others and their understanding. Communication was a two-way path, and my perception of words' purpose was exactly that. I'm sure everybody in the audience can relate to the fact that in terms of English class, um, or in terms of writing English class, mostly taught me how to write for my teacher. Uh, when grading, each teacher has different preferences in mind, and obviously in an attempt to get good grades, I would write what they wanted. My words were always for them and only them. Let me be clear, it's not bad to write according to what your teachers are looking for. It's an important skill to learn, not only for school, but in life. Though it wasn't until ninth grade when I discovered the importance of personal writing. When my words are for me, I can write however I want, about whatever I want. It doesn't really matter if they make sense to anyone else because they make sense to me. Most of the, to most of the time, my quote unquote writing is just me jotting down my thoughts before they can escape me. Putting them on paper makes them more permanent and putting more focus and attention on them in turn has allowed me to become more pensive and thoughtful than I once was. The other day, as I stopped by Mr. Kaufman's class in search of advice on how to write about writing, he handed me his copy of Fernando Pessoa's The Book of Disquiet. The Portuguese poet defies traditional genres of literature and similar, similar to mine, his writing is nonlinear and full of heart. This specific one was a compilation of thoughts or pieces, each diverse in their own right. And my favorite part is that the introduction includes the fact that what awaits the reader is the sheer serendipitous pleasure of opening the book at random and reading whichever fragment you happen to alight upon. In all honesty, I could not have chosen a better book for myself. Pessoa's style and philosophy of writing reflects a mirror-imaged mind, which, upon reading, gave me hope and confidence in the potential of my own words. Writing has no boundaries. I have learned this just as much as anything else. I am just as much a writer as Pazoa, who is just as much a writer as Hesse and Hemingway. Pazoa best describes that I am, for the very most part, the very prose that I write. And quite against my wishes, what I felt, feel is felt in order for me to write it down. Writing is my cathartic release, my exhale. <laughs> this right here is my exhale. This tiny torn up notebook might not seem like a lot. Truly it is worthless to all of you. But to me, this is everything. I dare say the most valuable thing I own, it's me. In very faded letters across the front of it, you would find it appropriately titled, Welcome to My Brain. <laughs> its crumpled pages and worn edges are a direct result of living in the bottom of bags and being constantly pried open and slammed shut. The, imp the imprinted fingerprints from its tightly clutched spine are mine and only mine. No one has ever read its contents, let alone known its existence. It's so ineffably and unconditionally mine. Pazoa explains that life is above all dreaming everything in order to convert it into something intimately ours. And writing for me is exactly that. Dear future self, you might not have thought about this in a while, correction, I know you definitely haven't. I know you're a different person than the one writing this speech. I know you've changed a lot, learned a lot, and have lived a whole other life. Though that's the beauty of it, don't you see? These words will never change. No matter how many times you reread them or how many more years pass before you do, these words will stay the same. They will always be here to remind you of a journey you once took, of a path you once traveled, the one you traveled alone, back to yourself, to me, to us. 
When you go to college, I expect you to have studied math or finance or economics. You love math and I expect you always will. Though I also expect you to continue to paint and to write. Not because you see a future in it, but because you don't. These words are not for others, nor for a grade, nor for money. These words are for me and only me. They may not be as perfect as you would like them to be or express your exact thoughts, though they do make these thoughts feel more real. I will always write because I can, but I don't have to. Not because I must for him or for her or for them, but because I must for me. I would like to leave you all with one last quote from Pizzoa that goes, if what I leave written in the visitor's book is one day read by others and, enjoy and entertains them on their journey, then that's fine. If no one ever reads it or is entertained by it, then that's fine too. Thank you.